Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man's Dame here with me. We both feeling a little bit under the weather. I'm coming off the back half of a cold. Dame feeling the allergies, but we got to gotta bring the pod to you. It's elite hoops to, to talk about. So, you Thanks. know, we got to be here. How are we doing today, Dame? Well, besides the fact that I'm dying over here, I'm, I'm feeling great. You know, my Lakers won. I predicted we was going to win. I had no worries, but we're we going to get on into all that later. Listen, make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe. If you see me duck my head off to the side a little bit, I'm either wiping my nose or sneezing or something, so I apologize for that in advance. But we can, we can get straight into it. We got, a lot, we got a lot to talk about today. For sure, and if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Music, I successfully was able to get it on that platform, so be sure to drop five stars, leave a review, share with your friends, your family, like I said. We got the TikTok out. We got the Instagram out. Be sure to follow both of those pages. Our socials are going to be in the description of the video on YouTube as well. So like we said before, we're diversifying. We're getting big on multiple platforms. So be yes, sure to sir. follow and subscribe on all platforms. But without further ado, man, we're going to get right into the game of the game of the night yesterday. The Warriors lose in six to the Lakers, as always. <laughs> As always, I'm going to give it to the Lakers fan first. So what do you think about this game? LeBron and AD able to close out here in six. And we're moving on to the Western Conference Finals. Man, we started this season two and ten. We were the 13th seed at the All-Star break, and we go into the Western Conference Finals, bro. That is – wow, that's crazy. But – um. Yesterday, uh, it was a really good game. I predicted uh, the Lakers to come out strong. I knew they were. They knew that they had to win this game. Obviously, they didn't want to go back to Golden State for a game seven because anything can happen at that point, and you're going to be on the road. So I feel like we came out, we handled our business, we closed the series out in six, like we should have. Um, the biggest takeaway: Darvin Ham actually made an, another adjustment, taking out Vando from the starting lineup and adding Dennis Schroeder, who. Plays great defense on Steph Curry, but also provides us um, a lot more offensively. So uh, that helped out a lot. As you can see, when LeBron was playing out of the post, when Anthony Davis was playing out of the post, the spacing uh, with that starting lineup was just way different. Like, he was able to make good passes out of the post. He was able to drive, be aggressive going to the basket. So I, I like that change. It Obviously, it worked. Um, so I, I like that from Darvin Ham. But honestly, my biggest takeaway – wasn't even anything that the Lakers did. My biggest takeaway was actually the Warriors and how bad this like supporting cast around Steph Curry yeah. is. Like it, it, bro. Clay Thompson. I don't know what's happened to him these past three games, but it's been bad. I, like he shot three for nineteen last night, two for twelve from the three point line. The game yeah. before that, three for twelve, two for six. The game before that, three for eleven three for nine from the three-point line, like eight points, 10 points, nine points. Like, that's bad. Like, that's unacceptable. That's, bro, he's supposed to be your second best player. He's looking for an, an extension after the season. Like, you you like you can't you can't get that type of production from, quote-unquote, your second best player. And, I mean, Wiggins was playing a little bit hurt, so I wasn't really expecting a huge game from him, especially because he had a, a really good game the last game. So your role players, I mean, you're not – if you get two good games in a row out of them, that's a bonus. That's a plus. So, a Draymond obviously he wasn't gonna go out there and score twenty points again. Like that's that wasn't gonna happen. So you really look at looking for your main star to show up. And Steph Curry, he had a slow start, but I mean he ended up I believe with like around like thirty points, something like that. He, you knew he was gonna get it going eventually, but yeah, Clay Thompson, man, that's it, it was it was just bad. If you're a Warriors fan, that's just, it's just sad to see and um the direction for these Warriors moving forward. I guess we could talk more about it after we recap these games, but I, I don't know where you really go from here. It's tough. Yeah, and, and like you said, to your point, even to start this game, like Clay and Steph both had open looks that just were not dropping, um, mm -hmm. and the Lakers kind of seized the opportunity to, to get out to an early run, and it felt like the Warriors never really fully recovered from that. You know, they were able to – kind of catch up a little bit in the second quarter. And then um, obviously that sequence there to end the half, AD blocks DiVincenzo um, and Austin Reeves hits a half court shot. You know, that's a five point swing there, puts the Lakers up by 10 at halftime. And then they were in complete command of the game in the entire second half. So yeah, Clay was 
10 for 39, 10 for 40 from three um, from game three on of this series, which, again, like you said, to be the second option, you have to be better. Um, sometimes it's a reality of being a three-point shooting team. If they're not going to fall, that's always going to be your, you know, what's going to bring your team down is when they're dropping is great. It's hard to beat, but when they're not falling, you know, you make yourself an easy target in that way. So um, three for 19 from clay in this game was, is rough to watch. Like you said, a lot of the shots um, that started, that started the game for him were open shots. Um, and they, they just never fell, never fell for him. Could never seem to get into his rhythm. Um, yeah. As you said earlier, 20 points from Draymond was not going to happen again. Jordan Poole was, I think, scoreless with four fouls at halftime, um, provided horrible minutes again. Unplayable. Um, yeah, I think Steve Kerr said after the game, he felt like this roster was maxed out, I think was the, the term that he used, and that this, this just wasn't a championship-level roster. Um, <clears throat> and try to stay away from all of the nasty narratives that's going on on Twitter right now and that you're going to hear on ESPN and – any of the big outlets for the next couple of days. Um, but, you know, just looking at this, like, for what it is, this was not a good enough team to make a championship run. I said that coming in. I had the Kings beating them in the first round. They got pushed to seven in that series. I had the Lakers in this series. We both had the Lakers in the series. Um, and, and, you know, they're, they, they bow out here in six games. And when you look at – what they've had in their previous runs to make to, to go to the finals or to win the finals, their teams have been more dynamic, deeper. They've had more size, not just on the interior. Like outside of Looney, they have no option, no big, right? So he's right. the only big on the team. They're lacking on perimeter defense. They're lacking on just length in general. You know, they mm -hmm. had an auto porter last year. That's a, that was a huge help for them. Bielitsa as well played quality minutes for them. He's not even, he's in the Turkish league now. So it's like, there were key players on that team last year who are no longer there. And the people that could have slotted in to fill those roles, guys like Kaminga, I would say weren't properly developed by Kerr throughout the regular season. Um, and leads us to a point where now he played essentially like no, no meaningful minutes in the series. Um, which is crazy because it's again his skill set lengthy athletic wing could have provided another, you know, big body, bigger body um, from a perimeter standpoint to put on the court that, you know, could have an actual impact on the series, but clearly they didn't feel he was, was ready for that, you know, that level of impact in that way. So yeah, it, this roster just wasn't, wasn't up to par for, um, you know, to really make a, a serious run at, at a championship. Um, I think I said it, you know, and, previewing this game on our last pod like it would take superhero level effort from Steph to be able to push this to seven or attempt to try to win this series and he tried right? you know, he put up he put up the volume of shots that you would need from him he almost shot 30 shots you know 14 threes like we said they weren't falling for him earlier um I think Dennis Schroeder did a phenomenal job up until his wild ejection um, at just trying to be as much of a pest on Steph as you can, trying to stick with him, bellying up with him on the on the perimeter and, and getting physical as much as you can with him. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, more than anything, like we already kind of touched on, like the Warriors shooting cost them this game. Um, and, and again, credit to the Lakers. Like, like I said, they, they took advantage of that from the get-go and seized kind of the momentum of the game and never really relinquished it from the first quarter on. So, yeah, LeBron also, I think this was his best game of the entire postseason. Um, I guess the, yeah, this was the most aggressive I think he's looked. Um, you know, he only shot three threes. He didn't even shoot a ton, like super efficient, 10 for 14 from the field. But mm -hmm. so much of their offense um, was facilitated through him, either off of his drives, dribble penetration, posting up – you know, kicking out, getting assists that way, or getting those hockey assists where he's just getting the ball moving on the perimeter um, off of his, you know, kind of deep penetration there. So I think that was, you know, key. The Warriors had no way to stop anybody really from getting to the rim um, for the Lakers, whether that was LeBron or, you know, D'Lo, Austin Reeves getting to the rim. 
AD work it down low. Like they had really no answer for anything for the Lakers defensively um, in this game. So yeah, a huge one here for the Lakers and they get a couple of days off and get to prep for them boys out in Denver now. Mm-hmm. Before, we, before we look forward to that series, um, I, I did love seeing LeBron um, or the offense run through LeBron out of the post. Like we said, the spacing was a lot better with Dennis mm-hmm. on the court. So it's a little bit easier to do that. But um, like at times, I feel like that's needed a little bit more. Like I understand D'Lo sometimes he he has it going so he can obviously he runs a point for us. Austin Reeves has the ball in his hands a lot. But I feel like at times where we need to really lock in and we need great looks like at, whether it's in the beginning of the game to set the tone or it's later in the game. And what was that game four where LeBron basically was running point guard for us? Like, I obviously it's LeBron James. So you trust the ball in his hands. You trust him to make the right decision. So I feel like moving forward, I would love to see that a lot more just because the offense runs so smooth when he's playing out of the post and facilitating, whether it's looking to score or whether it's looking to get AD the ball, whether it's looking to uh, pass out to open three point shooters. So I, I definitely like seeing that a lot. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that moving forward a little bit more. But going back to what you said about um about Kaminga, it's kind of funny because it's like we talked about how they need more front court presence, basically. Like another they need more length, they need more mm-hmm. versatile defenders. They like more front court scoring would be nice. So the pressure isn't all on the guards. But it's funny how like everyone's basically saying, Oh, Kaminga's not ready for the moment. That's probably why he's not playing. But it's like, did Wiggins not take all that time off like wouldn't you think that would be the time where you can possibly get Kaminga more minutes and get prepare him for these type of moments I'm not saying he has to come and be like the answer to uh, help you win this or be the reason you win this series but it's like he can be a little bit more prepared especially when Wiggins took all that time off so now that he's actually a rotational player that you can play in these type of moments when you need that length and versatility so it's funny because it's like when LeBron was out like you saw the, the main reason Austin Reeves is playing so well is because LeBron was injured. And when LeBron was hurt, Austin Reeves was on the ball a lot more. Mm-hmm. He was able to actually get comfortable in the offense. So it's like when Wiggins is out, you, I feel like Kaminga should have been the guy that you could put in there, get him more minutes, get him ready for these type of moments. So I'm not saying this series as a whole is on Steve Kerr because we talked about before. I don't think he got out, out coached. I just think that the roster that he had wasn't, it like I said, it wasn't a championship level roster, so it's yeah. like there's not much he can do. But not playing Kaminga earlier in the season, I do blame some of that on like the coaching and the decisions early on. So yeah, uh, that was really wild to see. Even Anthony Lamb, like a lot of those minutes went to Anthony Lamb in the regular season. He played a, a he was a pretty critical part of their rotation for a, most of the regular season in Golden State. Um, he doesn't get any run here in the postseason either. Um, so. Yeah, they were really thin. They went away from Jermichael Green in this game, too. Um, so they're smaller. They're lacking on the defensive side of the ball. They're lacking on interior. There's just too many holes in this roster that specifically the Lakers are constructed very well to be able to exploit. Um, I think they did a very good job of that in this game. And so, yeah, this – don't buy into all the narratives and I'm talking to the listeners, like what you're about to hear on ESPN, like it's all going to get blown way too far out of proportion. Like nobody's legacy is greatly impacted by this. Right. right? Like <laughs> there's no way that I'm saying that like all of a sudden Steph Curry is like, this is a huge knock on his legacy because he wasn't able to propel this team past the Lakers. Like we both just sat here and said that we don't think that this roster is up to up to par with what you would need um, to really be able to be a championship contender. And it's clear that this Lakers team is on a path to being a legitimate championship contender, obviously being in the Western conference finals. So um, like this game, this game, this series does not change how I feel about Steph. It doesn't change how I feel about Clay Thompson. That's the reality of being a shooter. Sometimes you get in a slump. It sucks that you get in a slump in the second round of the, you know, the playoffs and, it ultimately is a, a big reason why your team is eliminated, but you know, it happens. They're both the two of them to me are still Steph, the best shooter of all time, Clay Thompson, a top three shooter of all time. And this mm-hmm. changes none of that for me. So and it shouldn't. It's, right. It shouldn't change it for anyone. Like that it you have to give people room to make mistakes, give people room to fail. And I'm just like, yeah, he had a bad series. That's fine. Like plenty of people have had bad series, bro. Like it's not like I've seen 
Warriors fans overreact, talking about how Clay is garbage, like get him off the team. I'm like, right. What happened to all these years where he literally helped you guys in the championship? It's like y'all don't have four rings without Clay. So you can't exactly like, you cannot change up now. Exactly. Um, so yeah, don't don't buy into all the crazy narratives that you're gonna hear. Um and, and moving forward for this team, you know, looking realistically into the future, um, they are well above the the luxury tax. I think they're called tax aprons now under the new CBA. Um, yeah, they're almost 40 million above the the second apron, which is whatever that second line is for for luxury tax in terms of their their salary cap, which has some implications now in terms of second round draft picks and uh, the ability to sign mid-level exception players, um, you know, come free agency. So that limits them a lot there. Um, They have $214 million in guaranteed salary, totally tied up still when you have guys like Steph and Clay and Jordan Poole being the three biggest contracts there on their roster. Um, Draymond Green obviously has the extension um, eligibility up this season. And I believe he has a player option as well on his current contract. Um, And uh, yeah, they have some, some real decisions to make this off season. Um, there's also been some speculation that Bob Myers is probably out there as the, you know, the top executive there. So the guy that's crafted all of these, you know, deep rosters has been able to, to work with, you know, pennies on the dollar to sign quality role players there in the past um, is going to be a hot commodity and among the league in terms of uh, an executive that other, other teams are going to want to pick up. So that's going to be another huge loss for them there. Uh, Iguodala also is retired now. Um, officially I know he announced earlier in the year he was done after this season so with them bowing out of the postseason he's also done um so not affecting him too much on the court but that veteran presence in the locker room I'm obviously going to be be missed there as well so it's going to be a very very interesting offseason for the the Warriors here in terms of how they can try to look to retool I know I it felt like as soon as the buzzer sounded there was like five different articles from the athletic and ESPN that came out on what they're going to do in the off season reports that they've kind of gotten here over the last couple of days about, you know, the three of them still wanting to stick together that the Warriors still have belief that they have, you know, plenty of gas left in the tank, which is true. Like, again, I think this season might've been Steph's best season of basketball, which is crazy to say. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think he continues to elevate his game in all facets on the offensive side of the ball um, from a playmaking perspective, um, shooting off the dribble, driving off the dribble, finishing at the rim. I feel like he's continues to get better at that each year. Um, and so I think he has plenty left to go. Um, and, you know, Clay is only going to continue to kind of get healthier again. He'll be have another full season under his belt now. Um, so if they're able to maintain those three guys um, and try to retool around there, obviously, again, we have, they have to address the needs at the perimeter they have to address interior uh, presence and then just overall depth for this team as a whole. But yeah, big decisions for for Golden State going into this offseason. Yeah, one hundred percent. Honestly, the way Steph is playing right now, I wouldn't be opposed to them obviously keeping that core together and just saying, "Listen, Steph is playing at an MVP level. He's arguably the best player, one of the best players in the world right now. As far as his play, we can keep these guys together and just." go for it again, add some better role players around us. But as far as, as much as I was talking up Clay in his past, I wouldn't give him the extension that he was looking for, though, because I'm pretty sure he would want it like a four-year. So I don't even know the dollar amount. It was something crazy, though. But I'm not paying Clay that much. Honestly, if I would just try to – I would just try to keep the three together for as long as Steph is under contract, basically. Base everything mm-hmm. around Steph and then see where his play is towards the end of his contract and then go from there. But – Unfortunately, someone is going to have to get traded, though. Uh, people are talking about Jordan Poole, moving off of Jordan Poole. But, like, when I see it, it's just – it's tough because his contract, along with his horrible play in these playoffs yeah. and pretty much this season, it's like, if you're going to move off him, what are you going to get in return? It's like, you're selling right. him at his lowest right now. Like, maybe you can get someone to buy into, like, at his best, he's this. Or, like, in previous years before he got his contract, he's this. So, if you can get someone to bite on that, then I'd, I'd agree with it. But it's – I, I just don't know who you move him for and, like, what would you get in return. So that's a little bit interesting. But, like I said, I would try my best, just because Steph is playing at such a high level, to keep moving forward. Obviously, not, you're not going into no rebuild. But 
keep moving forward, keep trying to improve the pieces around him and just hopefully you can build another championship level team around Steph Curry and just go from there. Yeah. And between Jordan Poole and Draymond Green, I think I would probably say it's upwards of 70%. One of them is not on the team next year. Mm -hmm. Um, And even if they are both to start, they, they've got to, I think, really move off of one of those contracts. So obviously if Draymond opts in, um, you know, both of them being under contract upward, basically two $30 million contracts, essentially. Um, but one of them is probably just going to have to get moved just again with how they've been able to construct their roster in the past, trying to find guys on one year deals, um, veteran minimums, mid-level exceptions, like with the new CBA, I said, being above that second tax apron, you know, that is, it's impossible for them to do. They're no longer allowed to have access to the mid-level exception because of how deep in the hole they are, you know, with the mm-hmm. salary that they're, they're paying out. So um, there, I, I think they have to move off of one of them. I think obviously right now, Draymond probably has higher trade value um, just because again, like you said, Jordan Poole's performance in both series of these playoffs were severely underwhelming for him as a player and, even worse when you you factor in he's going to be a $30 million player next year. Um, and that's only going to continue to rise as the, his contract goes on. So um, obviously at the same time, I can't imagine internally anyone wanting to break up that trio of Steph Clay and Draymond. So yeah, I wouldn't want to be the guy tasked with, with having to make that decision because um, there's a lot that has to factor into that. Um, and they have to – they got to make some shape there because, again, yeah. as it's situated now, their their hands are a bit tied. And, you know, they, they, they ran this season kind of with that that mindset. We were able to get good contributions from guys like Steven Chen, who I think was a huge pickup for them. He played great this series and played great for them all season. But it, it's just not enough, right? So they, they, they got to get moved. Yeah, he, right. They, he, he's gone. So, so. – yeah, it, it, they definitely got some tough decisions. Um, if I was a Warriors fan, I would just hope and pray that, like Clay Thompson, has some self awareness and realizes, like, look, I'm I'm not the same player. I'm coming off of a horrible playoff series. Like this whole four year, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know how much money is gonna be, but I'm not paying Clay that much for that long, and he's already looking like a lesser version of his previous self. So hopefully, he can just have some self awareness. Like I said, just tie everything around or work everything along with how long Steph is going to be on the team and hopefully just build the roster as best you can around those pieces and hopefully, you know, go for another championship. But they, yeah, there, there is for some real, real tough decisions. For sure. Um, I don't feel bad to... though. I don't feel bad though. <laughs> I don't feel bad. Y'all be all right. Y'all got your rings, you know what I'm saying? Y'all got KD. Y'all had your rings. You were dominating the league. It's, it's fine. It's okay. I don't feel bad. <laughs> you said illegal screens. You'll be fine. <laughs> I saw a clip of uh, the GP2 one on Schroeder where it was like, I think Schroeder <laughs> kind of pulled him down a little bit. He did. Yeah. He literally was like, he's like, pass blocking. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Uh, before, oh, wait, time out. Before we move on, before we move on, I need to talk about what was up with that ejection, bro? Yo, what, yeah. Like, what was that, bro? Are you serious? I don't know that I've ever seen – an ejection like that before like I'm I thought I had to have missed something when it got called and they went back to the replay and they showed and I was like okay maybe it was something he said I I don't know what I'm missing here and they keep showing different angles and I'm like Draymond got the ball and put it in Schroeder's face like this and then Schroeder gets ejected from the game for that for bro that makes there like I, I think he was yelling, like, on the ball in his face. He was, like, yelling, like, let's go. Like, you know, everybody gets hyped right. or whatever. But my thing is, one, doesn't – like, Draymond does that every single time he makes a basket because, like, he barely ever scores anyway. Right. But anytime he makes a basket, he's, let's go, getting in people's faces. And I'm not – I'm not, I'm fine with not teching you for, for that. Like, you don't need to tech Draymond. You don't need to tech anybody that's just getting hyped after a basket or just, right. like, yelling. You know, it's basketball. You know what I'm saying? It's playoff basketball at that. But it's, like – if you're at the least, at least do a double technical. You can't just give Dennis a tech when he has the basketball <laughs> dubbed in his face by Draymond. Like, what are we talking about right now? How is that at least not a double technical? If it was a double, 
I'd be fine. It is what it is. Then, then that's on Dennis because you know you have your first technical already. You can't get ejected there, especially when you're making this much of an impact on the game. So if it was a double tech, I'd be fine. But it's like, why are you just teching Dennis? And the other problem is I 100% believe if that player was anyone but Draymond, he would have gotten the tech. That is 100%. the biggest problem. They, the referees let Draymond get away with absolute murder. Every single time he's called for a foul, he's cursing out the refs, yelling at the refs. It's like they will hold their whistle just because it's Draymond. Like, it's and it's ridiculous. And it's even worse. If he has one tech already, it's over with. Then there's absolutely – he could punch somebody in the face. He's not getting thrown out, bro. Just because it's like they know <laughs> if they throw him out of the game, like, it's over with. Like, the, all the backlash they're going to get. So it's like Draymond can get away with absolute murder. And I Draymond is smart, too. He knows that. Like he, so he kind of works around that. So that that kind of pissed me off a little bit. The fact that it wasn't a double tech, and you're gonna throw away Dennis Schroeder when he's having a great game. Like that was ridiculous to me. Yeah, I uh, like you said, it feels like he has such a long leash at times with refs, and you never want to see. Like the ideal game is any game where a referee doesn't feel like they made an impact. They just referee the mm-hmm. game, and that felt like a moment where the referees dictated an outcome of the games. That's a critical point in the game in the third quarter. Like you said, Dennis Schroeder had been playing great defense on Steph all game, just Mm -hmm. like pure hustle, effort, trying to fight over screens, like doing his best job to harass him. And and he just tech him up again and get him ejected out of the game. Um, And the game was still in striking distance for the Warriors, like 10, 15 point deficit for them at that point. So yeah, I didn't understand that ejection at all. I don't understand how that's a tech on Schroeder. I don't understand how that's not a double tech. Like I, so many different different things wrong with that. There, it's um, ridiculous, bro. The Warriors get so baby. It's so annoying, bro. They get treated so like, oh my god. That's hey, crazy. hey, if you have have them tell it though. Sometimes, fourteen yeah. free throws for the Warriors in this game. Forty two for the Lakers. How about you guys drive to the basket? How about that? Where, where are you? Listen. Oh, my God. Worry about hitting wide open threes before you worry about the refs and the foul calls, okay? I've seen, like, Clay Thompson played bad, and if I'm being completely honest, it wasn't like we were smothering him. He was missing wide open threes, like yeah. ba- like threes that he normally would make with his eyes closed. So, mm-hmm. y'all worry about your actual play on the court before we want to talk about the refs and the free throws and this and that. Like, I'm not hearing it from the Warriors, bro. I'm not. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like, That's I said, it. I like Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, that's another narrative that y'all are going to hear for forever, probably, about this series. And look, if you watch, if you, like, you don't even need to watch. If you just look at the statistics from the regular season, we talked about it already, so I'm not going to dive that deep into it, but the Warriors foul a lot, the Lakers drive a lot, and the Lakers foul the least. Literally. Like, that's <laughs> base-level logic. The expectation going into the series that the Lakers are going to shoot more free throws than the Warriors. If you just look at the shot diets of these teams, the Warriors shot almost 50 threes. The Lakers shot 26 threes. Right? Like, there's just significantly more opportunities where the Lakers are driving to the ball. We just talked about so much of the offense being predicated off of what? LeBron James driving to the rim. LeBron James in the post looking to get deep penetration into the paint. That's where the majority of fouls are going to occur. So, again, do not buy into some of these narratives that y'all are going to hear. Like, there's – and I guarantee you, if you ask anybody in that locker room about it, no one in the Warriors locker room is going to say that this game or the series was lost off of free throws or off of foul disparity or off of the refs. They mm-hmm. lost this game. They lost this, they lost this game particularly because of their bad shooting and they lost the series as a whole because – they have issues on defense, and they miss a lot of shots. Like, right. like there's so many. Obviously, we get to scheme and you know all the X's and O's. But like, if you're gonna boil it down to a couple of things, like those are the critical things. They had no way to stop any type of dribble drive from the Lakers, and like for one of the better shooting teams ever, like just dynasty wise, they miss a lot of shots. And their second op, they, there was no second option. For, from like game three on, it was Steph first the world, literally. So yeah. that is why the Warriors are in this position. Don't don't let anybody steer you all the wrong way. Um, 
No, yeah, moving on to, to the team that the Lakers are going to be facing now in the Western Conference Finals, um, the Denver Nuggets dismantled. I don't even know if that's the right adjective. For the second year in a row, the Phoenix Suns got embarrassed, annihilated. Like, I don't even know what the words are to explain what's going on in Phoenix at this point. But on their home floor in a winner-go-home situation, they just got the, the break speed off of them. 30-piece. They At halftime. piece For the half second time. year in a row. And both, it's weird because they were two different issues. Like when they lost to the Mavericks last year, they're down 27 to 57 at halftime. They could not score. This year, they're down 51, but they, they have 51 points. But they give up 81 points <laughs> in the first half. They yeah. can't stop anybody now. Right. Um, and that's been indicative of what we've been saying since the trade deadline, right? Like you trade away your depth, you trade away your best defenders. Who is going to guard anybody in the mm. playoffs? And what happened? Contavious Caldwell Pope outscored KD and Booker in the first half. That can't happen under any circumstances. Not at all. Not the way this, this team is constructed when you're so reliant on them scoring. That but, cannot happen. Campaign was the best player on on the Phoenix Suns in Game Six. He was hooping. He was, was hooping going crazy with that ugly little shot. That ugly little shot was cashing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, look, Kevin Durant. I don't even think took a shot until late in the the first quarter. There, D Book was struggling from the field. KD struggled from the field all game. Um, they combined for thirty five points. We were talking about they need to go for. 80 right. <laughs> if they were going to win this game. Um, and, and they would need to do that every game if they wanted to win this series. So just, you know, 50 off or so. Um, <laughs> obviously, and again, no Chris Paul again in this game. DeAndre Aiden had a, I think he said a rib contusion. He didn't play in this game. As critical as we've been of him this entire series and really their postseason run as a whole, he obviously was missed. Jock Landell is he can only do so much again. He's limited w- with his skill set. Um, Jokic had another 30 point triple double. Uh, like I said, Contavious Caldwell Pope was lining it up from deep early. Uh, Jamal Murray had some some big shots there as well. And I mean his game was over at the end of the first quarter. It felt like I I yeah. and I was editing a video and kind of like had it on in the background and while the first quarter was going on. I was watching, I like looked up. And it was like a five-point game. I glanced down. I looked back up, and it was like a 20-point lead. And I was like, what the heck just happened? Um, and the Suns had literally no response after that. Um, it felt like the, the Nuggets wanted it more. The Nuggets are just clearly the better team. They're the deeper team. You have guys like uh, Bruce Brown playing phenomenal minutes for them on both sides of the ball. Um Christian Braun as well coming off the bench, or Christian Braun as well coming off the bench as well. Huge point of attack defender. Like they just have so many different options and people to go to that they just like completely overwhelm the Suns. And again, for the second year in a row, they are bowing out in the second round, this time after trading for Kevin Durant. And the future is in a weird spot for the Suns team because Chris Paul is only getting older. And DeAndre Ayton is, I don't even know what to say. Apparently, he still wants to be there, according to his, he went out of the press conference and he said he's committed to Phoenix. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't know I don't what's know. going on there, but they got, I, they got questions. They got real question marks. He's committed to Phoenix. I don't know if Phoenix is committed to you, my brother. I'm going to be honest with you because they are already, they signed the about- contract. <laughs> But they're already talking about. I mean, that was before KD got there, though. Like, I mean, it's different. I feel like your 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 outlook on the future can change with that with that big of a move. So, like you've seen, they're already saying they're aggressively shopping Chris Paul, which is honestly, I don't really know who would want what a thirty eight year old six foot point guard who's that's slow gotten and injured in prone. every postseason yeah, like, since like twenty fourteen. Listen, Chris Paul is like probably my favorite point guard of all time. I would not want Chris Paul on my team at this point in his career. Absolutely not. And that's him. fair. And that's not even really a knock on him as a player. It's just, yeah. But we have to be unbiased and like we just have to be real with ourselves. Like, right. you just say he's 38. 
every single like every single postseason without fail, he gets hurt. So mm-hmm. like he, you can't count on him. It's like as great of a point guard as he is, and like how great his legacy is, like it feels like the wheels are falling off the wagon right now for him. And right. I don't know how even if he was on a better contract, like how much teams are willing to to trust in that, but definitely not on the massive contract that he's on now. And again, mm-hmm. I think I mentioned it before, like they knew that this was a possibility when they signed him to that deal. Like they just were coming off of the finals run. Like you need to keep Chris Paul there. So it completely makes sense. And you understand that's a four year deal. If you get two good years out of him and the last two years are downhill, but you get a chip in those two years, it's completely mm-hmm. worth it. You, whatever yeah. the extra the salary in those last few years are a wash, but following that that finals run, again, embarrassed against the Mavericks at home, you get embarrassed against the Nuggets at home, and now the decline looks like it's really kicked in, and mm-hmm. that contract is, just looks worse, and there's nothing additional to show for it, minus you just have KD now. All right. That's the, that's the risk they wanted to take. All right. So it's tough, too, because um, like we said, we we can tell as soon as that trade happened, it's like they they have no depth, like none at all, and that's the problem with having no depth. As far as um have like say they have four stars basically, I'm gonna just call them all stars. They have four of their main stars. It's one thing to have no depth. It's one thing to have no depth when two of your four stars are also injury prone, and in Chris Paul and Kevin Durant. Because Kevin Durant, mm. he's been dealing with some injuries these past couple years of his career as well. So it's like you already don't have a lot of options to go to off your bench. So then when one of these guys go down, it's like, now we really don't have any options. So that that's the problem. They need to find a way to add valuable rotational pieces to this roster. They want to have any chance of winning a championship or going far into the playoffs. So like I said, I don't really know where they go from here. They're trying to shop Chris Paul. They're trying to shop DeAndre Ayton, but it's like, like I said, who wants Chris Paul at this point? Side note, I see something somewhere that was like the Lakers are the favorites to land Chris Paul. I don't want Chris Paul. Why? Why? Where, like, where, where, does he, where like, does he fit in there? That's what I'm saying. Like, what? I don't know how like true that was, but I just I just seen it somewhere. I'm like, why? I don't want Chris Paul. What? Why would the Lakers want Chris Paul? That doesn't make sense. But they do have to do something to get some some valuable rotational pieces added to this rock roster to go alongside with Devin Booker and Kevin Durant. It's funny how um all of the problems that we talked about with the Suns when they made this trade, like it seems like every single one of them are popping up like right now. Talked about how they're injury all prone. at once, all, all at once, all at once. We're talking about how their stars are injury prone. Yep. Chris Paul gets hurt. DeAndre Ayton gets hurt. Talked about how they have no depth. That obviously was a problem because the team that had a lot of depth. We talked about how they need their two stars to go nuclear every single night when one of them have a bad game in Devin Booker they have absolutely like it's, it's one thing to lose like we're going to get into it later but the Celtics could have lost the game that Jason Tatum had a bad game but they were in the game you know what I'm saying with right. the Phoenix if they have a bad game they have zero chance of even competing like yep. they're getting 30 piece in the first half because their stars don't go nuclear so it's just funny how all of those problems seem like they popped up at the same exact time. Yeah. And going back to the the trade deadline, right? I think you see if you compared some of the teams that made the biggest moves at the trade deadline, when you look at teams like the Suns, who pushed all their chips to the middle of the table and said, we're going to go all in on just talent. We're going to forget the depth, forget the defense. We're just going to be like, bro, who's going to stop KD and Book? So they went that route versus Mm -hmm. the Lakers, who actually offloaded their bigger name star player in Westbrook, at least what it was when he came in, for a whole bunch of people that fit (laughs) and could play roles for the team, gave them options off the bench. One of those teams is in the Western Conference Finals. The other one is going to Cancun. (laughs) <laughs> but a- again this goes back to how we've talked about before you know one of our first episodes and how super teams are just constructing a team trying to be so top heavy talent heavy doesn't seem to be the way to go anymore um it, maybe it never really was unless you can really assemble 
like overwhelming amounts of talent. If you can't put Steph, Clay, Dre, and KD together, if you can't put LeBron, D <laughs> Wade, and Chris <laughs> Bosch together, is it really worth it? Because again, like a lot of things, health had to play a factor in all of those, you know, teams being able to win the multiple championships that they did. Because mm-hmm. we saw in Brooklyn, they they put that that same level of talent, you know, KD, Kyrie, and James Harden, they could match up from a talent perspective. And that team was deep. They had good role players there with them yeah. in Brooklyn. Right. They couldn't get the off the court right. And they couldn't stay healthy. Mm-hmm. So so much has to go right, even when you do go all the way in on getting, you know, top end talent. Obviously, things have to go right when that's not the case. But like we said, the re- the impact of it is amplified. Like you said, right. because no Chris Paul, no Aiden. Let D. Booker KD not have a good game. This is the result. Exactly. The risk is way more when you go when you do this all into the the top end or top heavy teams. Basically, the risk is way more. Like you said, even with the teams like in Brooklyn, they had solid depth. That still was the problem. They one of their basically both their stars got hurt pretty much over with. And like we said before, the super teams I feel like have never actually worked because even the quote unquote super teams that there were, like in Miami with LeBron James, D. Wade, Chris Bosh, still was constructed in a way that they were an actual team. Right. Like you didn't go into you didn't see that team was like, all right, if LeBron and D. Wade have a bad night, they're done. Like, no, they still have role players that can step up and give you viable production. They don't win those rings without guys like Shane Battier, Norris right. Cole, uh, Mario Chalmers, Mike Miller. Like right. They do not Ray Allen get, later on. Right. They don't get to that level. They don't get two rings without the other guys. Exactly. So it's like you can't just throw KD and D book out there and be like, I mean, we got it. Just hoop. Go hoop. Just go crazy. It, right. it doesn't work like that. Like, like we said with Golden State, even when they added Kevin Durant, they just added Kevin Durant. Like they still had a team. It's not like they traded away every single person on their bench and like come on KD. Like, no, they still had a great team around them so right like we said before that super team stuff it's it's hilarious how it's always kevin durant but that super team stuff it just seems like it's not the right way to build an actual championship level team right it looks and good I, though like it looks good on paper but it's just it doesn't work yeah and i want to be clear i don't even want to say the sun's team is a super team because like i wouldn't say chris book chris book chris paul mm-hmm. or uh deandre in our even in that same level of tier. So it's really right. like their duo with two really good players attached to them. Like to me, a super team, like you really have to be putting together like three legitimate superstars. Like I wouldn't even like, you could have a big three and that not be a super team. Like, I feel like I've seen people try to say like the, the bucks are almost a super team. Like with no, no, it's true. And KD, it's like, you can have three Absolutely. good players and not be a super team, you know? So the problem, but the sure problem is clear. though, the problem is though, the Suns put their team together as if they were a super team. That's what it feels like because like they put all like they went all in on a, on their four like I'll just say their four best players basically as if they were gonna have so much talent that we're just gonna be so much better than everyone else. So it's like they built that like they trade away camp the what well, cam with cam, cam Johnson, Johnson Mikhail cam Bridges. Johnson, Mikhail Bridges, like they traded away their viable pieces to get Kevin Durant. So it's like they went all in as if they were a super team, even if like looking at it, like obviously like DeAndre Aiden and Chris Paul aren't superstars at this point. So mm-hmm. it's just the way they put it together. Like yeah. they have that super team type of feel as far as the way they constructed their roster. Yeah. And one of the last things I'll say about the Suns here is, I know we talked about it before. It, it felt a lot, especially in this series that it was, Devin Booker was the primary option. KD was the secondary option, which is cool if it works. But I feel like just getting to why that even became the case is, again, just because he was traded there and got hurt instantly. He never really had a lot of time to get in a rhythm. And I think that also contributed to why we saw the series performance that we saw from Kevin Durant, where it feels like, again, I said in this game, that he didn't even take a shot until late in the first quarter in an elimination game where it's like, you need you and Booker to be the one-two punch that like basically carries y'all to the finish line. Mm-hmm. Like you need to be getting going from the start. And so it feels like he just doesn't have that comfortability, that flow, the rhythm that we normally see from, from Kevin Durant. Um, and I think you can't downplay just 
reps. Like he just didn't have the reps with this team in the regular season. Um, and so I, and as great of an offensive player he is, like it's tough to just like throw somebody out there in a brand new team on very minimal, you know, time played together in the regular season and then just like throw them into a postseason setting and expect, you know, phenomenal performances. So um, have to make sure that that's known. But look, at the end of the day, he had an inefficient series. He did not play up to his standards. This is the second year in a row that, you know, he's gotten eliminated in that that series was, I would say, underwhelming for his standards. Definitely last year in, you know, in Brooklyn against Boston. But here as well, like the rest of the factors aside, like he just shot much more inefficient than we ever typically see from Kevin Durant. And that hindered them. Because if it wasn't D book going, if it, Kate, like KD wasn't even really there to prop up even more scoring and between the two of them, it seemed like they just like ran out of gas there after game four. And that was all she wrote. Another thing too, people, well, these teams need to stop. Like I understand that it's a little bit different now as far as players being able to play for longer in their careers. And it's like still produce at a high level, like obviously guys like LeBron, Steph, and all that. But people, teams really have to stop relying on these older players because Kevin, Kevin Durant is what's thirty four years old. He's still an older player. Like I feel like you shouldn't force him to have that much weight on his shoulders and force him to be able to produce at that high of a level constantly every single night in a playoff setting where the other team is obviously preparing for you. They're playing you every other night, so like they're. They know what you do. They know what you do well. They know what you want to do. It's like you have to build a team around these guys and stop putting so much pressure on these older players. So, and I feel like that also contributes to his his inefficiency and his like poor playoff series this time. So, I don't know. These teams, I feel like, like you said, we just they just have to do a better job of adding valuable role players around these superstars. Yeah. Well, looking forward now um, to the Western Conference Finals. Uh, what are your initial thoughts kind of predictions between the Nuggets and your Lakers so the Nuggets obviously are the best team we've played so far um like I'd say vice versa too right the Nuggets the Nuggets playing the Timberwolves and the Suns like the Lakers are we're we're taking steps here like right they're another step above exactly so like looking back at the Grizzlies series I had no fear that we were going to lose that series the Warriors the Warriors series I knew we were going to win that series the Nuggets series, I still feel like we're going to win, but I would not be shocked if we lost. Like, I'm – my respect has grown a lot for the Denver Nuggets. Like, they are a legit team. They are a legit contender. I always knew Jokic was a legit, like, superstar, obviously, but he's the real deal. <laughs> so, it's going to be interesting. I do feel like we're going to win this series in six. I'm going to just keep the Lakers in six going. We won in six with Memphis. We won in six with the Warriors. I'm just going to keep it going. We're going to win in six. I'm going to just say that. I think we we are we have the the capabilities to steal one at home or steal one on the road I should say and then protect home court and then it, we go from there so I think we match up decent um I think Jokic I'm a little bit worried that Jokic could kind of bully AD a little bit because people forget Anthony Davis is playing the center first yes Anthony Davis is naturally a power forward Jokic is a legit seven foot two hundred eighty pound center like he is a big body center Anthony Davis is a great defender obviously so that worries me a little bit. Maybe Anthony Davis wears down later to the series. So that that definitely does scare me. But I, I think we have the personnel to beat them. I think we have the personnel to win this in six and then, you know, move on to the finals. So I'll see what game one ha- – I, I, honestly, I'm going to learn a lot more once they play game one. Then I'm going to really see – you know, so I'm going to really gauge how I feel about this series. Yeah, I'm not – like pre-series predictions are sometimes, especially once you get this late and this tight in the – you know, in the, the postseason – Like, it's a toss-up to an extent, but I think I've fully jumped on board with the Nuggets being the clear-cut title favorite on the East or the West. Mm -hmm. I think what I've seen from them, and again, like I just said, right, like, the Lakers are not the Timberwolves or the Suns. I completely understand that. But what I've seen from them and their ability to finish out both of those series, what I've seen from Jokic, what I've seen from Jamal Murray, what I've seen from Aaron Gordon, what I've seen from their bench play. They feel like the most complete team in this, this playoffs that's, that's remaining. And 
Jokic on any given night can be better, the best player on the court, regardless of who's on the other side. And so, again, if I had to pick, I would say Nuggets in seven. I think that, to your point, there's going to be a lot of very interesting matchups for both coaches to have to, to try to scheme and figure out the biggest ones being who on the Lakers is going to handle it handle Jokic Mm -hmm. if it's AD yeah I've got to make sure he doesn't get into foul trouble because that drop off if Mm -hmm. AD comes off the court is much larger for from a defensive perspective I'd say than if Jokic comes off the court we know the on off minutes for Jokic on the offensive end have been um rough for the Nuggets all year they've been had some flashes of finding a few lineups here in the postseason um, where they've been able to survive and, and, and even win the Jokic bench minutes. Um, and so if they're able to do that in this series, that can be huge. Um, so AD has probably the, obviously the biggest task in front of him that he had all season in trying to stop a two-time MVP um, in Jokic. Um, additionally, every, like the Lakers defense as a whole is going to be stressed in a way that we've never seen before um, with just how the, the Nuggets ball movement is how many screens they're running, DHOs, ball cuts, um, you know, skip passes. There's just so much that they're able to do aside from also having the ability to give the ball to Jokic in the post or besides the ability of giving the ball to Jamal Murray and letting him work. Like those are that those are the type of like things that you have that take your offense to another level. When you have closers like that, right? if you have a good – like flowing offense in addition to guys who can say we need a bucket right now though that combination of the two is very hard to deal with so mm-hmm. darvin ham has got his plate full ad vando schroeder like those key defensive players they're going to have their hands full uh, so i'm interested to see what they do there um and then obviously again on the opposite side of the ball how are they going to be like if ad is aggressive and he gets in that mode who's going to take on that challenge because i don't think it's going to be Jokic because again you don't want to have Jokic get into foul trouble the same way. You don't want to have AD get into foul trouble. So that's probably going to be somebody like Aaron Gordon. And then if they try to do what they did in this series, which was try to get Jokic into the corner a lot in the series against the Suns, I should say, but by putting Jokic off into the corner, that was effective because of the shot diet of the Suns. So much was warped around the mid range. Um, that's not the, and again, with the, with the people that the Suns are putting in the corner, it's guys like Landry Shamit, Torrey Craig, Josh Okoge, um, guys that are catch and shoot shooters it's different when you're playing the lakers and as we've seen in the series or just in this postseason as a whole that person might be lebron exactly. it might be austin reeves it might be mm-hmm. d'lo it's people that can attack a closeout people that can take him off the dribble so i think it's a little bit harder now for mike malone to be able to to try to hide Jokic in a way on the defensive <clears throat> side of the ball um so like i said I was in this series with, with the Lakers and the Warriors. It was that constant chess, chess match between Steve Kerr and Darvin Ham. We're about to start that all over again between him and Mike Malone because um, there's so many different key matchups and things that they're going to have to worry about and things that they also can exploit. And it's just going to be a constant shuffling of what do we got? What can we do? So um, I think regardless of who wins the series, I think it's going to go seven games. Again, I think my prediction is – Nuggets, just because I, I think they're mo- they're the most complete team. They would be my pick right now to, to win the, the championship. But um, I think it's going to be a fantastic series either way, um, especially if, if AD is up to the task and he's aggressive on the offensive end. It's, it's going to be fireworks. It's going to be fireworks. Billy, go to one Nuggets game. Now it's Nuggets in seven. Oh, go my One gosh. Nuggets game. <laughs> now they're the title favorites. You go to one Nuggets game. But no, nah, <laughs> nah, nah, obviously, they're, they're a really good team. I I have, I have nothing bad to say about the Nuggets. Like, it's it's definitely respect. And I definitely – I see why – like, you saying Nuggets in seven, like, it's a, it's a reasonable pick. Like, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, I wouldn't be super shocked if they were to win the series. They're legit title contenders. But I feel like we're going to be up for the challenge. The same way we're going to have to guard them, same way we're going to have to find somebody – or we're going to have to find a way to stop Jokic or at least slow him down a little bit. The same thing on their side. They're going to have to find a way to stop Anthony Davis. Like you said, they're going to have to find a way to stop our guards if we have our rotational players playing well. So it's going to be a great series either or. Um, I'm here for it, I, bro. I can't wait. This is It's going to be a real, real good one. Like you said, the chess match, that's been – honestly, that's been 
one of the most interesting things to look at when you're watching these playoff games, how these coaches switch things around and make certain adjustments and how it affects or like, don't in some cases game. or don't exactly. <laughs> and how it affects the game. Like it's been really, really, and not even just in the Lakers series, like just in, as far as mm-hmm. all of these playoffs, it's been a really interesting thing to actually look at. So I'm, I'm excited, man. I'm, I'm excited. Lakers are six though. I'm excited. Yeah. That, uh, that's the series tips, I think on Tuesday. So mm-hmm. a couple of days of rest for LeBron, which is probably much needed. Uh, oh, we, we taking game one. We taking game one. You giving us what? What's that? Four days of rest in Denver, bro. We got four days of rest, bro. I don't. We could be playing in Mexico, bro. It's up. Yeah. We're, we're, we're winning, bro. We're winning game one. If, well, we win, look, if we don't win game one, we win a game two. We stealing one on the road. I'll tell you that much. Speaking of stealing one on the road, and this is what I've been waiting for all podcasts. To be honest, with you. <laughs> <clears throat> let, me, let me clear my throat real quick. Mm-hmm. What is wrong with the 76ers? They are the 76ers. That is what's wrong. They're a Doc Rivers led <clears throat> team. They're a James Harden. Like, listen, I don't know if it's just in their DNA. I don't know. The Sixers just can't. They can't close it out. I don't understand why they just cannot close it out. Let me pull the stat back up because I want to make sure I, I got this right. Doc Rivers in elimination games is. He's one and nine in elimination games. Is this right? This might not be it. I'm gonna find it in a second. Either way, <clears throat> I've never. I don't think I've ever seen a game where <laughs> to advance to the conference finals for the first time in a beats career. It was served to you on a silver platter. Here, Jason Tatum didn't make a shot in the first half. He has. Three points at halftime. There's no way you lose that game. Absolutely no way that you lose that game. Under any circumstance. The fact that it was even close with Jason Tatum playing as abysmally as he did in the first half, basically through the first three quarters of that game, is unacceptable. Like, completely unacceptable. And you're at home. You are at home like just and you literally just went to boston (laughs) and won a road game in boston to set up what should have been a game six at home you get your chance to go to the conference finals you just won the mvp you got all this momentum their bucks are not in the playoffs anymore like do y'all not see the moment that is in front of you Mm -hmm. and now it feels like all that momentum has been ripped away. It's going back to Boston. Jason Tatum got hot in the fourth quarter. So I feel yeah. like he's about to come out game seven, hot to start. And I don't see, like, honestly, as I said before this, before that game, I didn't see a way that the Sixers lost. I just had it's Joel Embiid. The momentum is there. The story is there. His family's been at the game. He just got the trophy. It just felt right. Mm-hmm. Clearly, I was wrong, but I'm going to say it again. <laughs> it feels right that the Celtics feel like they just dodged a huge bullet. They mm-hmm. should not even have a chance to have gone to game seven, and now that they are, they're about to close it out and take care of business and go play the Heat in the Eastern Conference Finals again. See, the main thing I got from them losing this game is the fact that they should not be trusted as title favorites like a Denver, like the Lakers. Because you've seen these closeout games. Let's talk about the West Series. These closeout games for Denver, they just ended it. Like, they came out. They knew it was a chance to just put these guys away. Let's not even play around. Let's not waste any time. And they got them out of here. And they're on the the road. They're they're on on the road. road. Exactly. The Lakers, we're at home. We don't want to go to a Game 7. Absolutely not. We're not. We don't want to go on the road. Let's not even waste our time doing that's not playing around let's come out early let's come out strong and let's win this game the Sixers you're at home game six Tatum has three points through three quarters three points and it's not like Jalen Brown was killed or I gotta pull up the stats Jalen Brown ended the game with 17 points they so were like, 
Brogdon and Smart carried the load for them through three quarters, and Jason exactly. Tatum was like, I'll bring us home. I'll show up finally. Right. And, like, like, credit to him. He had, a like, outside of purely shooting, you know, he had he finished with six assists in this game. He was good on the offensive side of the ball. He made a lot of good plays on the defensive side of the ball, crashed the glass. Rebounding. Like, every mm-hmm. other aspect of his game was good. Yeah. Boy just couldn't find the basket. And as soon as it started dropping for him, what he had, like, not, Three quick threes there that basically iced the game there in the fourth. Yeah, four in the fourth. Four three. He had three points, ended with nineteen. <laughs> like, come on, man. You can like this. That's that's a game. Like you said, you have an MVP. Harden is playing well. He's like clearly like dismissing those playoff choker rumors coming off a great playoff game. Max, he just had a thirty point game. He's playing well. Your team is hitting threes. It's like. That is a game you have to win. Like, you cannot lose that game. If you are as legit as you say you are or as people think that you are, that is the type of game that you need to win. So, right. like, even even if somehow they win game seven, say they win game seven, no disrespect to the Heat, they go on and they beat the Heat, they go to the finals. I don't care who wins out of the West, I'm picking them to beat Philly. If, if they end up making it that far, I'm picking them to beat Philly, whether it's Denver or the Lakers. Denver, Philly would be crazy. And never feel it would be wild. The big man battle that would be <laughs> that would be kind of nice. I'm not yeah. gonna lie. The big man battle would be crazy. To to complete my rant, because I could not believe what I was watching. <clears throat> I I wish I had the like the play by play. I don't know if it, okay, here we go. Let me pull this up because with six minutes left in this game, it's 81 to 81. How does the MVP of the league, the leading scorer of the league, not have a single post up for the rest of the game? It's not like there's a situation where you need a three, you mm. need a shot. It, it is a tie ball game. The Sixers are up later, right? Five, you can go down to five minutes left, 83 to 81. Every single possession – even where they're running, the, the pick and roll has been great for them this whole series, this whole year. James Harden, Joel Embiid, pick and roll. And they're hitting this little pocket pass, and he's pulling up mid-range, pull up mid-range. Bro, who on this Celtics team can guard you? Right. In the post. Not a soul, bro. It's Al Horford. Hey, hey. Al, that game five was clamping late in the fourth, though. Not, the, not this game. The game before that, maybe – Listen, I'm not a narrative pusher. That's not what we do over here. But all I know is Al clamped up late in the fourth game five, and Joel don't want to post up late in the fourth game six. That's all I'm going to say. <clears throat> Look, people going people to come from Doc Rivers' head, whatever. At the end of the day, <clears throat> the two of y'all, James Harden and Joel and B, should be disgusted. Hundred percent. There is absolutely no between the two of y'all. All the experience y'all have. Uh, P- PJ Tucker, everybody on the court. You tell me, it was nobody that was like, "Hold up, get on the block." Right. Get Here. the ball, bro. Go. If they like- if they double you, swing it. I don't care. And if they double you, shoot it. I don't care. You need to be going to the paint. Why am I watching so many mid-range shots right now when it is a tie ball game? You are the MVP. You're the leading scorer. You're the most dominant player. One, him or Giannis, right? One of the most dominant players. The most dominant center we've seen since Shaq. And you bail out the defense for five straight minutes in a closeout game. I could not believe what I was watching. It was so frustrating. Like, just from a, like just from a fan perspective, like, I'm not even a – Sixers or Celtics fan, just like watching as a basketball fan, I don't understand how that is what the offense looks like to close out this game. I just it makes no sense at all. Well, Jokic had fifty three in that loss, <clears throat> all the way down beyond a minute. He's working it down low in the post, looking for touch shots, floaters, bodying people up. That's what your game needs to look like. I don't want to feel like I always have to compare you to, but one of them just had a 30-point triple-double to close out the Suns. On the road. Right. You just 
bailed the Celtics defense out possession after possession after possession late in the fourth and now have to go to Boston and try to win a game seven. Those make that those decisions, that type of effort, that type of aggression makes a difference. 100 percent. And I know you say you don't want to compare them to, but I mean, that's just reality at this point. They're, they're the two best big men in the league. They're the two last MVPs. They're always going to get compared to. So mm-hmm. it's like it looks even worse, like you said, the fact that he had a 30-point triple-double and took his team. Like, he he took them there. Like, you know, he got over that hump and went to the Western Conference Finals. So it, it, it's a bad look. Like I said, that's just a game that you have to win. Like, or at least if you're going to lose that game, I'm going to go down with Embiid post. I'm a, like, that is the MVP. Like, if we're going right. to lose – we're going to give you the ball and we're going to live with whatever happens, bro. Like, we're not just going to, like you said, we're not going to let them off of the hook with you just shooting these little mid-range shots. We're going to give you the ball in the post. And if if you make if you make bad decisions, if you lose, if you miss shots, we're just going to live with it, bro. We can, I can live with my best player having the ball in those moments and it just not going our way. But him letting the defense off of the hook, taking those mid-range shots, not giving these posts up, it's like, that's that makes the loss 10 times worse because it's like right. we could have did something differently and the outcome could have been different. So I I, I don't know. Game right. seven in Boston. It's, look, it, it, it can't get much worse for Jason Tatum. And if they were able to win this game, like I said, a lot of that, my rant aside now off of Joel and Harden and the Sixers, right? Like a lot of credit has to go to Harden and Harden, uh, Brogdon. And Marcus Smart for the Celtics, carrying a lot of the load offensively while Jason Tatum was could not buy a bucket, um, keeping them, you know, keeping this game close all the way down to the wire until Jason Tatum was able to, to get it going there in the fourth quarter. Um, like this Celtics team is deep. They're a phenomenal team. They were one of the title favorites for a reason. I think that they are the deepest team. Them in Denver are like arguably neck and neck in terms of depth, I would say the Celtics are a little bit deeper. Um, and again, have the, the current sixth man of the year, Malcolm Brogdon as well. Um, like, you're just not going to get this opportunity again. There's And like, if it happens again, we have to have a super serious conversation about Jason Tatum, which he's had his real lows in this series as a whole. Like, these slow starts cannot happen for a guy that was fourth in MVP voting. But like, there's you, I don't know, unless I'm wrong, there's no world he comes out and has that type of shooting performance again at home. Listen, at this point, I'm I'm not trying to predict anything because anything can happen at this point, bro. Because if we, honestly, if you're looking at the game, the game, as much as we talk about late in that game that the Sixers kind of threw it away, the game should not have been close. Like, they, the Celtics came out swinging and they had, I believe, what, a 14-point lead, something like that. Yep. If Jason Tatum doesn't play, like, absolute garbage they probably win that game like easily like they play yeah. that game probably isn't even close later on so the same way we're talking about uh Joel Embiid we need to be talking about Jason Tatum because that game should not have even been that close that's true yeah. had you played like the MVP candidate that you are so I don't know like at this point I don't know whether he's gonna have a great game because I thought I honestly thought like we said I wasn't counting out the Celtics to win this game I just thought they would do it differently I thought it was going to be a huge Jason Tatum statement 35 40 point game like he did last year in Milwaukee exactly so it's like at this point I don't even know what to expect from anyone on the court whether it be Jalen Brown he could have 20 points in the first quarter and end with 22 points Jason Tatum could start like we've seen he could have zero points in three quarters and end with 30 like bro I don't know what to expect from anyone on either side of the ball James Harden can have a great game he can have a terrible game where he has 10 points. I don't know what to expect. So going into this game seven, I just want to see good basketball. I hope that everyone plays at their absolute max because that's just going to mean, you know, a better basketball product for the viewers. Right. So I don't know what to expect, honestly. I have no idea. I would hate to be a fan of either of these teams because it just looks like stress oh, and, yeah. and, and pain right now. So I just hope it's a great game seven. I don't know who's going to win. I just, I'm just going to watch the game and see. Well, I, I'm a firm believer in momentum being real, and, and it just feels like it has to be so deflating for the Sixers to have lost that game that going into Boston on game seven, I know I think Jalen Brown said he felt like the crowd has been flat in Boston the last couple of games. They're going to get mm-hmm. up even louder. It just feels like everything is trending in that direction for us to get 
a rematch of the Eastern Conference Finals of last year, and Boston is going to take Game Seven tomorrow. That that would be my bet for my money. Um, but again, like you said, it's going to have to be a significantly better performance from Tatum and Brown. But, um, see, I I agree. I fully agree with you saying with what you're saying as far as momentum being real. But that's the thing. It's like if that's the case, the Phillies should have won that game. If like they had all of the yeah. momentum, and then it completely just flipped. So it's like. With these two teams, I just – you really don't know. Like, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. And I know – I think we touched on it maybe last pod about kind of the the inconsistency. It feels like Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum can never be on at the same time. I was Mm -hmm. listening to to J.J. Reddick's pod, and he had um, the Steve Jones and Nikias from the dunker spot on. And they were trying to kind of touch on why that happens. And the way that they kind of contextualize it was, A, there's so much overlap in skill sets there. And then, B, you have two wing players who are always going to be guarded by the two best wing defenders on the other team. So Mm -hmm. looking to try to do some type of pick and roll action or some like any type of two-man game between the two of them is just going to be even tougher because the matchup that you want to seek out are always going to be on people that are guarding, you know, Tobias, right? So, like, that's why I feel like it always feels like you have to get – it gets so isolated between one of them because you can't ever have both of them going. The other one is kind of, like, relegated to becoming a standstill guy in the corner. The other one is working on ball, whether it's getting a ball screen or just looking to isolate off of, a, you know, a matchup that they like um, to try to score. So, um, mm-hmm. I think that's a good point, and – Aside from just like the Celtics ball movement as a whole, which they've been great at all year driving kick and just continuing to you know turn a good shot to a great shot. Um, they need, they have to try to find a way to get the both of them going because um, the defenders that you're going to see in Miami, and, and we'll get to that, you know, their closeout game last, but um, their defense and, you know, the way that Spo has them playing is on, a completely different level than what they're seeing from Philly or what they saw from Atlanta in the first round. So they're going to have to take their game up to another notch or else we're going to be looking at a Jimmy Butler in the finals as an eight seed. I'm not opposed to that, especially if my Lakers make it. I'm not opposed to the 2020 <laughs> rematch. I'm not opposed to that, man. The but... bubble will get validated. <laughs> I mean, if the, if the Celtics win the Western Conference from the bubble – and the Eastern Conference bubble is the exact same. That all that's all I'm gonna say. All those people that want to say the bubble didn't count, the bubble wasn't real basketball, this, that, and the third. It could be the same exact one, like how it was in 2020. That's all I'm gonna say. That's so. such a lame and tired argument because, like, <clears throat> what about the bubble wasn't real? Other than okay, there's no crowd. At the end of the day, did they not play the same 48 minutes of basketball? Bro, put it this way. Let's take every single team in the league. Let's let's eliminate no family, no crowd, nothing. You can't even go home. We're all in the same hotel. Let's put you just in the gym and let's all just play it out and have the best team wins. Is that not the like the pure is, is, is that not the rawest form of basketball you can possibly have? Like eliminate all of the distractions eliminate you don't you can't even go see your family bro like you can't do any of that all your fans are on zoom boxes on the led board (laughs) no fans in here it is me versus you that is it and we're just playing and whoever is the best is going to win how is that not the like the purest form of basketball how is that how is that somehow worse or like gets discredited compared to like normal like the way it regularly is like that does not make sense to me that's why the arguments that the bubble doesn't count has always been out of pure hatred in my eyes because it's like you don't even have a legit reason as to why it doesn't count. You just say it was the bubble. Like, right. honestly, any anyone that says that, ask them why. They're going to be like, bro, it was the bubble. Like, I don't know. Like, but that's all they say. It was just the bubble. They have no yeah. actual reasoning as to why it does not count. It and doesn't make sense. It's, it's crazy because that even extends beyond the fact that the Lakers won it. I feel like these this, this would be – like, some people would feel this way regardless of who ended up winning that championship because – I've seen people try to discredit Jamal Murray. They think, oh, he's just – that was – they call that it is true. bubble yeah. Jamal, right? Yeah. But mm-hmm. we're seeing him be a playoff riser again. Donovan mm-hmm. Mitchell was a playoff riser in the bubble. He's still a playoff riser this, you know, this past series with Cleveland aside. 
and again, like the same, we're trending in a way where we have the potential to have the exact same conference final matchup from the bubble. Obviously, all of these teams' rosters look different, but at the end of the day, bro, like like you said, there's no fans. It's just basketball. It's pure hoops. How could you try to discredit that? And, and who's band- playing well? Jamal Murray. Who's playing well? Jimmy Butler. Who's playing well? The Lakers. Like, all these – it's just the bubble guys. Like, come on, bro. The only case y'all got is TJ Warren. He sucks. That's the only case y'all got. He was Michael <laughs> Jordan in the bubble, bro. He was hooving in the bubble. Yeah. If y'all want to say that, yeah, I got me there. I have no case for that. I'm sorry. But other than that, bro, the people who try to discredit the bubble, I do I that's a little bit interesting because normally I always felt like it was just because the Lakers won it. But now that you do mention it, they do try to discredit Jamal Murray. They just try to they try to discredit uh Donovan Mitchell. I feel that it's 10 times worse, though, the fact that the Lakers won it. And, you know, how people hate LeBron. So, like, yeah. it gets 10 times worse. But I do I do agree with what you're saying. Like, people just try to discredit it as a whole. And I feel like just because it was something that you're not used to and that is different, that doesn't right. mean not legit. Like, what are we talking about? Like, that, that those arguments just never made sense to me. Yeah. Well, speaking of the bubble, right, going back to – the, the team that came out of the Eastern Conference in the bubble, the Miami Heat are back in the Eastern Conference Finals. I can't say it enough. We're down by two with three minutes to go in the last game of the play-in. And Spolstra and Jimmy Butler have taken this team to places nowhere else could have dreamed of if you were not a, a Miami Heat fan. And they take out the, the Knicks in six games. Um Going back to to game five of this series, Jalen Brunson and Quinn Grimes both played 48 minutes, um, and they were able to to get it done on their home floor in a tight fault game. But going back into Miami, some no-shows on the Knicks side. A lot of them. Julius Randle and R.J. Barrett combined four for 24 from the field. Um, I think Julius Randle only made one field goal in the second half. You know, he stayed – both of them stayed aggressive. They got to the free throw line. They, you know, they got um, – both of them in double digits, basically completely off of free throws. But, you know, Jalen Brunson, hats off to him. A phenomenal performance. The most points by a guard in Knicks playoff history. Um, that's his team. <laughs> that's his team now. 100%. I, I, I still feel like I'm surprised at how many people still give it to Julius Randle and – I think some of that is, again, you know, he got the all-star nod. He got the all-NBA nod. But to me, it's, it, Jalen Brunson is the best player on that team, night in, night out. Um, and, and he showed it you know, clearly in this game. Um, watching this game, both of these teams, especially, you know, basically halfway through the fourth quarter, they made a very conscious decision to say, we're going to trap, we're going to double y'all's best player and force someone else to win this game. And what ended up being the difference maker down the stretch is when the Heat were able to trap Jalen Brunson, they forced a lot of turnovers off of it. You're getting the ball to guys like Julius Randle, RJ Bear, who were struggling. They weren't able to, to make shots. Um, the game was ended by a, a trap on, on Jalen Brunson there who had a chance to tie the game. And he turned the ball over there in the paint, which was critical because, you know, he had been really good from a, a turnover perspective all season, especially in this series. But, you know, that ended their season effectively. But conversely for the Heat, um, when you look at what they did, tra- they were trapping Jimmy Butler deep behind the three-point line, trying to get the ball out of his hands quick. Um, and a lot of this has to go credit to Bam Adebayo, who was able to find space around the free throw line in the middle of the court and kind of become that middleman there and find shooters off of that initial pass, beating the trap that way. Um, and so they found – Big threes for Gabe Vincent, threes for Kyle Lowry. Um, one of the biggest plays, they got the ball to Bam in the middle, swung it over to Vincent in the corner who attacked top and on a closeout who swung it back out to Max Struess who hit a big three there. Um, I think with like five five minutes left in the fourth. So um, really just they, they, they played the, the defense better um, down the stretch and were able to make more plays on the offensive end, better decisions that led to buckets. Um, and the Heat squeaked this one out 96 to 92. Um, like I said, close this series out in six and await whoever the winner of Boston Philly is on Sunday. Yeah. Um, 
I I only got to catch bits and pieces of this game. I didn't get a chance to watch the whole thing, but from what from what I did see, it seems like the Heat are at their best when. Well, it's it's I'm not gonna say at their best, but it's a bonus, a huge huge bonus when Bam Adebayo is aggressive yes. and is actually playing the way he should. Because yeah, I understand Jimmy Butler is a great player. Jimmy Butler is the best player on this team, but it's like he cannot do everything. He can't. I, like he can't. Like Bam Adebayo has to be aggressive. Use his his speed, his versatility to to either get looks for someone else or just be aggressive in himself in getting to the basket, making shots. Like he just has to be more aggressive for this team, especially if they're gonna beat whoever comes out of this Boston versus the Sixers series. Yeah. But as far as the Knicks, uh, like Julius Randle, I don't know at this point. I don't know what you do with him. I don't know what you could do. But it just seems like constantly in the playoffs when you need him most, <clears throat> excuse me, he just does not show up. Like like you said, this is Jalen Brunson's team. Jalen Brunson is that guy. I don't know if he can be a number one on a championship level team. At the bare minimum, he's a number two, though. He, yeah. he is that guy, and he is a playoff performer. In the biggest moments, even when they played with that, when he, when he was with Dallas, you just saw that he was a not afraid of the moment. He stepped up. Like, he is a big-time player, but. I know RJ Barrett had a had a bad game, but honestly, I'm I'm fine with RJ Barrett's play in this playoffs. Yes, it's a little bit inconsistent, but it's like he's what what more can you really ask from them? He's not a superstar. He's not one of the best players on your team. So it's like, what more can you really ask for out of him? It's but much it, improved it, from previous years. Exactly. So this is it's definitely a step up. But Julius Randle, you're all NBA guy, you're all star. It's like you can't have these bad performances from him. We always talked about with in these playoffs. Your stars, you're supposed to be able to pencil them in for at worst their averages in these playoffs. Yeah, they can have a bad game here and there. That's fine. But it's like you're supposed to give me consistent production. Like you're not a role player where you can be up and down if we expect to win moving forward. So I don't know if they're they going to try to move him. I don't know what they do moving forward. But Julius Randle, is just, he's, he's not the answer in the playoffs. 16 and a half points per game from your all-NBA player is not – not going to cut it. No. Not going to cut it at all. Um, I, I have a stat here. Jalen Brunson was 14 of 22 from the field in this game. The rest of the Knicks were combined 13 of 49. Wow. So uh, the man was out there by himself on a mission. He tried his absolute hardest. Playing 45 minutes. And Right. And had the ball with a chance to tie the game. You can't ask for anything better than that. Like I said, they were trapping him completely, um, you know, the back half of that fourth quarter. And one rough decision there to, to try to force a pass in deep that Bam was able to tip and get stolen. So, yeah, this this Knicks team moving forward, I think it's very possible we've seen the last of Julius Randle in a Knicks, Knicks uniform. I said, I know we've had discussions on the last pod about, you know, his body language and stuff of that nature, but – all that aside, like we already said, this performance is unacceptable from him. He's played relatively awful, I'd say, this entire postseason, um, mm. averaging 10 less points per game than he did um, in the regular season. And just, like, really inconsistent, leaving Jalen Brunson out to dry. And a lot of these – R.J. Barrett, I think, stepping up was huge for them, and that is – something that they can really look at as, as a positive. And I don't think this season is a, a lost call. I think this was a, a win for the Knicks. Like, That's not most, a failed season. Right. Most of us, like most NBA fans in general, I know us two uh, in particular, didn't think they would make it out of the first round against Cleveland. So um, mm -hmm. they're, they went further than I thought that they would. Um, and there's a lot to still, you know, look forward to. Like I said, I think that they found their – they're, they have their point guard for sure, and Jalen Brunson. I think he's their guy moving forward. I think R.J. Barrett has taken huge steps forward and continuing to grow as a player. Um, I think Mitchell Robinson had a great, you know, definitely in the first round matchup against Cleveland, had a great postseason. Hartenstein played great minutes for them. I think he's a phenomenal pickup. I think Josh Hart is a free agent, but if they're able to bring him back, um, that'll be a huge, you know, huge piece for them moving forward. Um, but – uh, again, it's going to be tough to win games when, like I said, the rest of your team is combining for basically 14 for 50. Um, yeah. So, unfortunate for the Knicks. I think this Heat defense is – they're so locked in with each other when you watch them play. It's, you know, whether – no matter the scheme, whether they're in man, you know, 2-3 zone, 3-2 zone, they're running some type of trap defense. 
everyone rotates for each other. They always seem to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and they're, they just, everybody has so much hustle on the court, even when it's guys like Duncan Robinson, who, you know, are so you know, limited athletically, they're giving 110% effort all the time. Spolstra, I think is clear in a way the best remaining coach left in the playoffs. Um, and so I, you can't count them out at this point. I, I've counted them out in both of the series and they, they've burned me both times. And so going into the next series, they have my utmost respect and are very real possibility that they could go to the finals. Who do you think that they – who do you think that they have a better chance of beating out of the Sixers or the Celtics? On paper, I would want to say the Celtics, right, because mm -hmm. you don't have to deal with Joel. But right. at the same time, what I've seen just now – from the Sixers, maybe you do want to see them because if if Joel isn't going to attack Bam like that down the stretch in a fourth quarter, you're bailing them out. Right. And we've seen up and down play from James Harden this entire playoffs. And look, Jimmy Butler going to get up if it's the Sixers. That, get that up. Was he, what he, I was he's going to get up regardless, but if it's the Sixers. <laughs> I don't know how many gears he's got. I feel like he keeps finding a new one every single time, but mm -hmm. if it's the Sixers, he's got something to prove. So That that was what I was going to say. I was just going to say off the sheer fact that revenge Jimmy Butler mm -hmm. might turn into the greatest player <laughs> ever, bro. Oh, my God. If they if they end up playing the Sixers, Jimmy Butler is going to play out of his mind. And like you say, yeah, if Joel Embiid, Joel Embiid is not going to be as aggressive – along with Miami Heat, just the way they're playing team defense right now, the way they're just all bought in on both sides of the, of the ball or of the court, I should say. Um, that's that's going to be a tough one. That's going to be a real tough one. Honestly, it's going to be tough for whoever comes out of that Sixers versus the Celtics series. And I'm excited for it. I really am. It's going to be physical like every Heat series is, regardless mm -hmm. of who it is. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just need whoever it is, just beat them down. Wear them out. So when they play the Lakers in the finals, they're gonna be too tired. They're not gonna have the energy. We just gonna cruise through the championship. <laughs> uh, look, I know both of our voices, both of us are, are under the weather, so <laughs> we covered all the games. So we're gonna go ahead and cut it off here. As always, we appreciate you for tuning in to another episode of the Off the Glass Podcast. Mm -hmm. um, please be sure to, to follow the socials. We got the Instagram channel, we got the TikTok channel. Both of those are at Off the Glass. Um, so please be sure to follow those. <clears throat> we got YouTube shorts going up. Um, like I said, if you're listening to this on Spotify and Apple and I was able to get that set up properly, be sure to drop five stars and leave a review as well. Um, but as always, I'm Billy. That's my man, Dame. And we out. Peace. Yes, yes sir.